Dwight D. Eisenhower John D. Rockefeller Emilia Earhart Neil Armstrong Elvis Presley All of those people are important historical figures that shaped American history in one way or another. And all of them have one thing in common, the German ancestry. I already made some videos about German-speaking minority groups outside of Germany before, but this one is different. The United States of America is by far the country with the largest ethnic German population outside of Germany, with over 42 million citizens identifying as German-Americans. This makes it the most common ancestry in the US, even ahead of Irish or English. Since the history of this group is so important and interesting, I decided to release several videos regarding this topic, to cover as much of it as possible. You are now watching the first video of this series, during which we will learn more about the journey of the first German settlers and the history up until the end of the American Revolution. The first German settler to set foot on American soil was Dr. Johannes Fleischer, who arrived with the English at Jamestown in 1607. It would take over 70 years however, until the first larger group of Germans would cross the Atlantic. These first settlers, numbering a bit over 30 people from 13 families, originated from the town of Krefeld, in modern-day Germany. They arrived in Pennsylvania on the 6th of October 1683 and founded the settlement of Germantown, near Philadelphia. Because of this historical event, the 6th of October was declared German-American Day in the US. The chosen destination in America wasn't a coincidence. The families that arrived there on that day were all Mennonites, an Anabtist Christian group like the Amish, whose members were oftentimes victims of persecution where they came from. Pennsylvania, on the other hand, was founded by William Penn, who was part of a non-conformist religion, the Quakers. He declared that members of persecuted religious movements could come to Pennsylvania and live out their religion in peace. Penn visited Germany a few years prior. That's how the people of Krefeld heard of this opportunity. More and more German settlers arrived soon after, also from the same region as the ones before them. Even though the Mennonites were the first to arrive in America, the number among Germans that migrated to the US during the colonial era was rather small. Most of those who came were Protestants. Germantown grew and prospered, mainly thanks to the talented German artisans who were especially skilled in linen weaving, a profession many of them practiced back in their old home. In 1738, a printing establishment was opened in the town, which would later become the largest in the American colonies. The first German-speaking newspapers in America were also published there. In 1743, the first Bible, translated completely in the European language, the German Sauer Bible, was printed by a German immigrant. It would take another 40 years until the first English Bible was printed in the colonies. Another notable event took place in Germantown in 1688, the first public protest against slavery in North America. The German Quakers, using a petition, condemned slavery, as it went against their religious beliefs. In the petition, they referred several times to the Bible's golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. They brought the petition to Quaker meetings, but none of the meetings wanted to pass judgments on the matter, since it would have had such a big impact on the colony's economy. At the beginning of the 18th century, the first substantial group of German speakers crossed the Atlantic towards America. At that time, the region of modern-day southwest Germany, especially the Palatinate, was plagued by wars, a famine caused by said wars, and a harsh winter. As many as 30,000 Germans, mostly from the region along the Rhine River, crowded Dutch and British ports with hopes of getting a passage over the Atlantic and to live an easier life in America, 13,000 of them in London alone. There, they were put into refugee camps outside of the city, because there were just too many of them. The British and Dutch authorities eventually had to prohibit German peasants from entering the cities. At first, the British government helped them and raised money from charity to support them. But as time went on, their patience slowly faded away. They started looking for ways to get rid of them, especially of the Catholics among them. They offered them a choice. They could either convert and become Protestants, or return to where they came from. Most Catholics choose the latter option. This had a significant impact on the German migration that followed. The German Catholics understood the message, that they are not welcome in England or in their colonies. And for the rest of the century, almost all of the Germans that came to America were Lutheran or Reformed Protestant. The English eventually agreed on sending the remaining German refugees, which they collectively called 
poor Palatines after the regional Germany to the American colonies. 600 arrived in North Carolina and roughly 3,000 in New York. Their life together in the London refugee camps gave the Germans a group identity that they didn't have before. They arrived in London in many small groups of different families from different villages, but arrived in New York as one big group of Germans. This was a very important moment in the development of a German-American identity. The beginnings in New York weren't easy though. About one quarter of the people that set sail from London died either on the voyage or in the first few months after arrival. They settled down along the Hudson River several miles north of New York City. They were told to produce tar and pitch for the British Navy as a repayment for the journey across the Atlantic. This led to conflicts, however, since the Germans didn't want to do that. After two years and many quarrels between New York's government and the Germans, the project was cancelled and they had to fend for themselves. Some of them stayed along the Hudson River, some moved to New York City and others to New Jersey. One group, however, wanted to move as far away from the British influence as possible and moved to the Schoharie Valley. There, along the Mohawk River, they formed an alliance with the Mohawks. They achieved this by sending one of their own to live with the tribe and learn the language. This plan worked and the relations between the two groups were strengthened. The man they sent to the Mohawks, Konrad Weiser, would later become one of the key figures in Indian white diplomacy. Another noteworthy person that arrived with those 3000 Germans was John Peter Zenger, a man who would later lay the foundation for freedom of press in America. He began as an apprentice to New York's first and only printer at the time, William Bradford. A few years later, he began to publish his own newspaper, the New York Weekly Journal. The articles in the newspaper were oftentimes critical of the government and especially of the new governor, William Cosby. It didn't take long until Zenger was prosecuted in 1735 for printing false, scandalous, malicious and seditious criticisms of the governor. At that time, according to English common law, it was outlawed to insult or criticize the government and its officials, even if what you say is true. Zenger's lawyer asked the jury to strike this law down, as it was unjust. And to the great surprise of the public, the jury's verdict was not guilty. Over time, the German settlers that arrived and stayed in New York in 1709 grew closer and closer together and basically forgot the different regional backgrounds. They and their descendants remain known until this day as the New York Palatines. From the 1730s onward, German immigration intensified all the way until the American Revolution. But because of the prior mentioned problems with the New Yorker government, most of them preferred other regions. The vast majority of them arrived and settled in Pennsylvania. The reasons why Germans migrated to America during that time were of economic and political nature. More than half of the immigrants could be considered as poor and had very few possessions. Furthermore, the nobles in southwestern Germany, where most migrants came from, tried to gain more power over the population and subsequently raised taxes and fees. Emigration was basically the only way for these people to change their situation. One of the biggest issues for the people back then was financing the trip to America. For example, due to the political state of Germany before the unification, it was necessary to pass through dozens of custom stations if you wanted to get to the port of Rotterdam by boat on the Rhine. And even if you managed to get through all of those stations, you still had to wait at the port until a ship would leave for America, which sometimes could take up to a few weeks and would cost additional money. As I already mentioned before, the majority of people trying to emigrate was very poor, so they had to find a way to finance all of these expenses. The most common way to do that was by going to the colonies as a redemptioner. How that worked was that the shipping company brought you to the colonies without having to pay up front, but sold you into indentured servitude once you arrived there, which meant that you would have to work without a salary for a specific amount of time for the person that paid your fare. How long you would have to work would be negotiated directly between the migrants and the prospective master, but it usually ranged between 3 to 6 years. If a passenger's indenture hasn't been sold once the ship wanted to leave the port again, they got confined until a buyer presented himself. Redemptioners would mostly work as laborers on farms or as servants in households. They were forbidden to marry during the service period and, like slaves, could only leave the master's place with his permission. On the other hand, redemptioners would normally gain valuable experience in the profession and even some English language skills during their service. Those were also the reasons why even immigrants with sufficient funds would sometimes enter servitude voluntarily. Some would also continue to work for the former master in exchange for a salary after the contract was over, and some even became masters themselves later in life. 
So even though this whole redemption system wasn't as bad as slavery, it nonetheless took advantage of the migrant situation. One of the responses from the German community to the system were the founding of German societies in the most important port cities, like New York City or Philadelphia. These institutions played an important caritative role, especially for new arrivals without a personal network in the colonies. German settlers in the 18th century tended to settle near other German communities that already existed in America. This led to ethnic German majorities in some areas, especially in southeastern Pennsylvania, a region also known as Pennsylvania Dutch country. The term Dutch doesn't refer to the Dutch language though. The word is a derivation of the word Deutsch, which is how the people that settled in this area would say Deutsch, the German word for German. But back then, the English would refer to all Germanic languages and dialects as Dutch, and so the name stayed. In 1790, Germans already made up around 9% of the total free population of the United States, and more than one third of Pennsylvania's population. They were by far the largest non-English speaking group in the colonies. Areas like Lancaster County even had a German speaking population of over 70%. However, at that time, noteworthy German communities were only concentrated on the states of Maryland, New Jersey, New York and of course Pennsylvania. German Americans fought on both sides of the Revolutionary War but were generally more sympathetic to the Patriot cause. Many of them, however, especially the religious sect people, preferred to stay neutral because of their pacifism. The ethnic Germans that fought for the United States were organized in either fully German regiments or were used to fill up the ranks of other local militias. What's interesting is that a lot of German auxiliary forces from Europe fought for the British during the war. They contributed to roughly a third of Britain's total troops in North America. Of the roughly 30,000 German auxiliaries, 16,000 were sent by the Landgraviate of Hesse Castle alone. That's why oftentimes today, all of the German mercenaries that participated in the war are collectively referred to as Hessians. One way in which both pacifist and non-pacifist Germans contributed to the Patriot cause was by undermining the morale of these German auxiliary forces and convincing them to desert and stay in America. The US government incentivized this by promising every deserter 50 acres of land in their country. As many as 5000 Hessians could be persuaded to lay down their arms and remained after America's independence was achieved. The German American with the biggest impact on the war was probably Friedrich Wilhelm von Steuben. Von Steuben was a former Prussian military officer who came to America to help them gain their independence. When he arrived there and saw the state of the US armed forces, he was very unsatisfied and took the training into his own hands. He turned a bunch of undisciplined volunteers into a formidable force, based on Prussian standards. His training led to a significant improvement in the performance of the US troops and the influence of his work could still be felt decades later. He even wrote the first drill manual of the US Army, based on Prussian techniques. How he would communicate these drills to the soldiers became a quite interesting ritual. Von Steuben spoke very little English at that time, so he wrote down all of his drills in German. His secretary would go on and translate them into French, and the secretary of George Washington finally translated them into English, so that Washington would know how to command his soldiers. He was granted the rank of a major general and for the remainder of the war served as George Washington's chief of staff and one of his most trusted advisors. Von Steuben was very popular among his soldiers and is widely considered to be one of the founding fathers of the US Army. As a reward for his service, he was granted US citizenship after America won the war. He ended his military career and was honorably discharged in 1784. After his military career, he first settled down in New York City, but would later relocate upstate to Oneida County, where he would live until his death in 1794. During his last years, he served as the president of New York City's German society. In honor of von Steuben, a day dedicated to him is celebrated in many cities throughout the United States every year in September, effectively serving as a second German-American day. The German-American Steuben Parade is one of the largest parades in New York City and is attended by millions of people every year. That's it for today's video. Make sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on part 2 of this series, where we will talk, among other things, about German-Americans during the American Civil War and the mass immigration of the 19th century.